Greetings, everyone. I'm Myron Douglas, a health communicator with the Division of Environmental Health Science and Practice in the National Center for Environmental Health at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's EH Nexus webinar uh, titled Fungal Diseases and a Changing Environment. There will be a presentation and a Q&A session with the, with the presenters. All participants joining us today are in listen-only mode and closed captions are available for this webinar. Next slide, please. Today's EH Nexus webinar will be available to view on demand. You can find the recording for today's web, excuse me, today's webinar at the C CDC EH Nexus webpage at cdc.gov slash nceh slash ehsp slash ehnexus or by scanning the QR code on your screen. Next slide, please. You may submit questions at any time during today's presentation. To ask questions using Zoom, click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and then type in your question in the Q&A box. Please note, we often get more qu questions than we can answer in a live session. Also, if you are a member of the me media, please contact the media relations team at me media at cdc.gov or by using the phone number listed in the top right. Next slide, please. Please note the findings and conclusions in this presentation are those of the authors and do not represent the official position of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Next slide, please. I would like to now introduce our moderator for today's webinar. Dr. Nancy Chow is the Deputy Branch Chief for the Mycotic Diseases Branch within the Division of Foodborne waterborne and environmental diseases in the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the CDC. Now I turn it over to Dr. Chow to introduce our presenters. Dr. Chow, the floor is yours. Thanks, Myron. And to echo what Myron has said, hello everyone, welcome. We're so excited that you've joined this webinar. Uh, focusing on fungal diseases and a changing environment. So as Myron, my name is Nancy Chow and I'm the moderator. And so today, next slide please, we have three speakers, three uh, fungal disease experts who are excited to share their insights on the potential role of climate and environmental changes on the emergence of new fungal pathogens, on the development of antifungal resistance, drug resistance, as well as the changing geographic range of some of these pathogenic fungi in the environment. And today, what you're about to hear is all part of a wide event that we've been hosting this week called the Fungal Disease Awareness Week. Uh, this is an event that started seven years ago in 2017, and each year it's gotten more established and more globally recognized. And so we'll drop a link in the chat uh, where you can find out more about Fungal Disease Awareness Week, as well as a graphic that kind of shows all of the themes that we've had each day this week. So on Monday, we kicked it off with the World Health Organization, the WHO, uh, with a webinar called When to Think Fungus. And then on Tuesday, we focused on healthcare associated fungal infections. On Wednesday, we focused on antifungal resistance. And then yesterday, we focused on diagnosing endemic mycoses. So today, as our final webinar, we're excited to get started. So we will now 
go on to our first speaker that I will introduce. Our first speaker is Dr. Arturo Casadevall. Dr. Casadevall is a globally known expert in the host immune response to microbial pathogens. He is professor and chair of molecular microbiology and immunology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where his team focuses on how microbes cause disease and how the immune system defends itself. And prior to joining Johns Hopkins, he served as director of the Center for Immunological Sciences at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. So please welcome Dr. Costaval. Uh, thank you, Nancy. Uh, let me share my screen and hopefully we can get going. Um, so uh, what I'm going to talk to you today is about candida auris emergence, and in particular, I'm going to uh, articulate the climate change hypotheses. So candida auris uh, has been in the news quite a bit recently, but it's a, it's a new disease. It was first isolated from the ear canal of a patient in 2007. So the auris comes from ear, Latin from ear. So retrospective, when people saw this for the first time, they went into the collections and they thought, well, maybe it was always there, maybe it was misclassified, and they found occasional isolates. But it appears that the earliest isolate would have been from 1996. And then came the big bang with this disease. That is the years between 2009 and 2013, when it was simultaneously isolated in three continents in South Africa and India in 2009, in 2011, in Kenya and China, and in 2012, in Venezuela. And here is the key. These isolates were different. They're from different clades. It's not like somebody took a plane from one country to the other. So we're dealing with a new pathogenic function. How did it emerge simultaneously in three continents? So we have three theories for its emergence. One, that it was always there, but people miss it. Well, I think that has been ruled out. My retrospective analysis shows that it was not there. Some people have argued that it was the result of azoles used in agriculture and medicine. That doesn't work very well because it's unclear how antibiotics selection will need to a new virulence in a species. Antifungals uh, anti, uh, are used in agriculture. They would select for resistance, but not necessarily no virulence. And the third idea is that it's a result of climate warming. The, when it was selected as a variant that could grow at human temperatures. And the problem with this theory is that it's conjecture and it's based on simultaneous uh, circumstantial evidence. I wanna point out that we proposed that this would happen back in 2010 in a warning in, in Ambio, and I will develop this idea in the next slides. So the world is getting warmer, this is a fact. I think that overwhelming scientific consensus, and we're living through it. Extreme weather events are the result of a warmer climate. Temperature is one thing that affects all aspects of metabolism, from the cell membrane to replication to every enzyme. So all organisms, whether microscopic like us or microscopic, must either adapt or die. And global warming is going to, warming is going to have great effects on the microbial world. We live in a world in which there are relatively few fungal species that are pathogenic for humans. And these tend to come from either the host or the environment. So from the host, we have the candida species, the dermatophytes, cause athlete's foot, and pneumocystis, which is a rare fungus uh, in the cosystasis in the immunosuppress. And from the environment, we have histoplasma, aspergillus, cryptococcus, coccidioides, and blastomyces. But the point is, that we have relatively few. And this is because we have a remarkable resistance to fungal disease. In contrast, and this is a paper from Matt Fisher, who you will be hearing again in a short while, uh, they're devastating entire ecosystems. And the one thing that these ecosystems often have in common is that they are room temperature. That is, these organisms don't regulate their temperature. So I bring you what makes us so special. Why are we so resistant to fungal diseases? Well, one thing is that we have adaptive immunity. That means that we have B cells, T cells, innate immunity, 
But you know what? Frogs have it too. And yet they've been decimated. What makes us different from the frogs is that we are warm-blooded. Uh, and some years ago, in collaboration with Vincent Robert, we analyzed a collection for susceptibility to temperature. And what you can see at the top there is that most fungal species do pretty well up to about 30 degrees centigrade. But then after that, their viability drops dramatically, such that for every degree between 30 degrees and 42, you can exclude 6% of fungal species. My good friend, Abe Bergman, took that data and used a formula for the how much energy we need to maintain temperature. And he asked, what is the optimal temperature by which you don't have to like eat all the time and keep out most fungal species? And the maxima was 37. And that suggests that our temperature is best adapted for keeping out this fungal kingdom. And that may account together with adaptive immunity for a relative resistance. Human fungal diseases are more common in the cooler parts than systemic infections. Nail fungus, at least foot, dandruff, which is, what, by the way, is an infection. And in babies, fungal diaper rash occur in cooler regions. In the lab, experiments have shown the powerful role of temperature in, in, this, in helping fight fungal disease. So work of John Perfect, if you take a, a bunny, has a temperature of 40 to 41, you cannot give a systemic infection with cryptococcus, even if you put it directly to the brain. But you can give it in the cooler areas, the skin and the testes. But if you now give steroids, temperature is not enough, you, get, you have a dead bunny. So the idea is that this is this remarkable resistance is coming from advanced immunity and our high temperature. So these are the twin pillars. And fungal diseases manifest themselves if you injure or damage one of these pillars. So in the late 20th century, we saw AIDS, cancers, immunosuppressive drugs, and fungal diseases go up. And then, but endothermy is difficult to damage because we can't live at cooler temperatures than we are. But now imagine that the organisms adapt so they can survive above 37 degrees. So the second column, can be taken out by climate change. The power of temperature to inhibit urban fungi. This is a Daniel Smith, who is in my laboratory. He's been collecting isolates in Baltimore. And you can see you, he plates them. And at 30 degrees, most of them grow. But at 37 degrees, only one grew. And that happened to be an isolate that causes disease, Candida tropicalis. White nose syndrome in bats gives us a remarkable evidence for the importance of temperature. Bats in the United States have been coming down with this disease in 2006. This, the bats are resistant in the summer when their temperature is 37. But in the winter, when the temperature drops to 10 to 12 degrees, they can be killed by this fungus. If you take the infected bats into the laboratory and just feed them and let the temperature come up, they can clear the infection. So today, most pathogenic fungi reside near the equator. Uh, this is epidemiology, but fungi can be rapidly evolved to higher temperatures. And here is a dramatic demonstration of that done by a company. This is a fungus that they were trying to make it better for controlling insects. What happens is the insects sun themselves and can elevate their temperatures and, and eradicate the fungus. So what they did is, over a few months, they were able to train the fungus to grow at 37 degrees. Fungi can rapidly adapt. It, they, so evident, there is evidence that they are adapting. When people, cities are heat islands. This study, for example, look at the isolates that were from cities versus isolates in rural areas. And the isolates in the cities were already better adapted to grow at higher temperatures. And these results are consistent and suggestive of rapid fungal adaptation to heat. Sometime, some years ago, we published evidence that the fungi had been adapting to already to climate change. This was looking at collections. When collections get an isolate, they look at what is the maximum temperature. So in the left here is a noisy blob. The top curves are the ascomyces, which are already temperature adapted. Notice that they don't change very much. 
The bottom one is the basidiomyces. And those lines that you see are show that they are appear on average to be more tolerant to higher temperatures. And this may have begun in the late 80s. Now to add, to add more problems, we appear to be getting colder. Uh, this is a study that was from Julie Parsons' lab uh, in which they looked at temperatures over the last century. And because we live in cleaner environments, there is less inflammation, less uh, parasitic diseases. It appears that our temperatures are getting colder. So I worry that we're having a collision here. Uh, and now let's go back to Canada Oris. So the closest side soils of Canada Oris are not very well adapted to temperature. Uh, but, and I pointed out that the one common denominator I can think of about this four, con three continents is they're very different climates, very different societies, very different practices, but they have all been getting warmer. So the idea is that this organism was out there in the environment. It was already loaded to cause disease. And over the last few decades, it adapted such that it could move into humans. There is some evidence that the isolates from the environment, and this is a great work from Anurag uh, Chaudhari in India, in which she showed that the isolates from remote areas in the Andaman Islands were less temperature adapted than those that are, for example, a beach that is frequented by humans or clinical isolates. So in summary, the emergence of candida oris is theorized to be a, a consequence of uh, climate uh, work change. The validation or, re or rejection of this uh, climate change explanation will require a better understanding of the thermal tolerance of sea oris and a mapping of its occurrence in the natural environment. And here is the warning. Climate change could bring new infectious disease as environmental microbes, which currently cannot cause disease because they cannot tolerate your temperatures, adapt to higher temperatures, and become capable of defeating or thermal defense. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Casadevall. Well, I'm very much looking forward to our Q&A that we will have after the three presentations. So to introduce our next speaker, who is Dr. Matthew Fisher. Dr. Fisher is a professor in the Department of Infectious Disease Epidemiology at the Imperial College School of Public Health. You can often find Dr. Fisher and his team trekking across the globe to delve into an ecological study site, most recently the Pyrenees. Dr. Fisher is internationally recognized for groundbreaking science that employs advanced molecular tools like genomic sequencing, as well as epidemiological and ecological methods to uncover factors driving emerging fungal infections. So please welcome Dr. Fisher. Thank you very much, Nancy, indeed. And I'm now going to share my screen. I hope you can see that fine. And I'll go into present a moment. Yeah. Excellent. So today I'm going to talk about, an ex I believe, an extremely interesting case where the mold Aspergillus fumigatus is evolving resistance to fungicides in the environment, but also in the clinic. So let's just skip to humanity's history of combating fungal disease using antifungal chemicals. So ever since we became an agrarian species and started trying to grow and store um, uh, the, the vegetables that we ate, we had a problem with molds rotting those down. And so we used to steal the water away from them in the 17th century using salt and urine, and then slowly keyed into the fact that you could actually use chemicals to slow the growth of uh, fungi and to protect our goods. And in the 20th century, there's an explosion of modern fungicides as we started iterating ever better chemicals. And that race is still continuing to this day. In the animal space, it was a lot slower. These drugs are very toxic. And it was only in the 20th century that we invented the four classes of antifungal drug that are with us today. OK, so this is where we are at the moment. Now, the fungi don't just take this assault lying down. 
they adapt and evolve to this strong directional selection that's um, imposed on them by these highly toxic chemicals. And in fact, it's pretty amazing that resistance to our antifungal armamentarium occurs to all the drugs that we use against plant and animal fungal infections. And this slide here comes from a review of ours in 2018, where we show the panoply of mechanisms that uh, fungi use to survive our chemical assault. Now, what's really important here is because fungi are metabolically very similar to animals, they're the sister kingdom, remember, there's a limited set of targets. And that means that we use or can use the same chemicals in, a, in the environment, in crops, as we do in the clinic. And the azoles are a classic case of this. So I'm going to refer to this as dual use of a antifungal chemical. Now, this presents a very specific problem that it, I think is actually reasonably unique to combating fungal infections. So the azoles started to become more and more widely used in the 1980s. And they're very widely deployed. And it's that point back in the 80s that the literature started to get populated by examples of fungi that had evolved some form of resistance. And this is the number of species on the left. And you can see the cartoon as these, are rec these resistant fungi are recognized across the planet. And obviously, agriculture recognizes this because the fungicides stop working and new methods of control have to be iterated to give us hard core and durable food um, security. So this is a, a case of Zymoseptoria evolving resistance to epoxyconazole, very widely used fungicide. Now, these azoles, of course, are used in the clinic and in agriculture. And so you then start to think about the question of whether or not what's happening in the environment actually has a consequence for human health. And that's what I'm going to explore here. So the molds that we're exposed to are potentially pathogenic. And of course, every single day we inhale hundreds, if not thousands of fungal spores, which our immune, immune system expects to see and indeed thrives on combating. However, there are pathogens in there. And if we have some form of risk factor, then they can present cause serious disease, sometimes fatal. These spores waft gently on the air and penetrate the deepest alveoli of our respiratory system. Now, one almost ubiquitous spore in the air is Aspergillus foot fumigatus. So there's a mold, it's a saprotroph, it's everywhere in the environment, and it's a hardcore decomposer of carbon. And it's a thermophile, so it's very happy at 43 degrees, degrees, 60 degrees won't kill it. So in the compost heap, it thrives and it just rotters that, rots that material down. Now, those of aspergillus spores pouring out of this active decomposing uh, compost heap. And so while most of us are fine, these are patient cohorts that are at risk of aspergillosis should a spore establish in their lungs. And you can see there's many common risk factors there that you'll recognize, cystic fibrosis, cancer, congenital susceptibilities. And also if you've had a severe respiratory virus infection, such as severe influenza or COVID-19. Now, when you present with a suspect or confirmed aspergillosis, the clinician will reach into their, uh, their, their, their bag and they will give you some form of azole, okay? Now, the first cases of azole-resistant aspergillus fumigatus were seen um, in the 1980s. And this is uh, uh, um, the, first, uh, the first paper that presented resistant aspergillus in the clinic. Okay, but since then, there was a steady increase in case series. And these are the two classics, one from Clinical Microbiology Lab in Manchester and the other from the Netherlands where the clinicians and the microbiologists were recognizing increasing resistance in those aspergill cases of aspergillosis. And this was the kicker. Many of these were from patients which had never seen an azole. So at that point, the idea started to come, and this was raised by Paul Verwe, that these patients acquired their resistance from, from the environment. Okay. 
So I'm now going to drop into the genomics that we use. And I'm going to ask your eyes to do something unfair here, which is to follow three plots, space, time, and relatedness. So space here is the isolates of aspergillus that we've collected, and many, many collaborators involved in this effort, and sequenced. And the relatedness is the relatedness of these isolates. So this is very much how you'd uh, see, say, for instance, COVID-19 variants presented. And at the bottom is time. So this is about 1,200 isolates. And we can go back here to just after the First World War. And this is a wild type isolate here with the red arrow. On the right hand side of the plot, you can see the alleles for the target locus for the azole antifungal. So I'm um, through here to the Second World War, the 1940s, and everything is wild type. 1980s, 1993, and then 1998, boom, we have our first sequence, azole resistance allele at the CYP51A locus. This is called tandem repeat 34. Okay, so we're going through the 2000s, and now we've got another variant here called tandem repeat 46. We go through to 2015, 2017, and we're now through to the present. So what you've seen here on the right-hand side is a great diversification in alleles at this locus, and these are what confer resistance uh, of aspergillus to the azoles. And you, the sharp-eyed one, of, of you will notice that the resistance is highly clustered. So there's been a limited number of originations of resistance, and it's clumped together in what we, what we call clade A, and hasn't been homogenized by a combination across the whole of the aspergillus population. This is a very interesting property of resistance. It also appears that this clade A resistance appears rarer in the Americans, Americas compared to Europe. Now, there are many caveats surrounding this observation, and it needs to be tested much more thoroughly than we've done here, but I've just thought I'd point it out because most of this audience is in the USA. So the study that we did in the UK was we sequenced UK clinical aspergillus cases of aspergillosis and compared those to them from the environment. And you can see here from this plot that clinical and environmental aspergillus are very highly similar to one another. They're not separate populations. And when you actually look at the resistance that's in those genome phylogenies from those UK aspergillus from the environment and the clinic, you see that same clade structure that I presented in the global population. And this is a bit of evidence that convinced us that those patients that had acquired, that had azole resistant aspergillus infections had acquired those from the environment was because we repeatedly isolated that genotype from the environment. Those isolates had to have been inhaled and established in the patient. So we're convinced that those patients were infected by pre-acquired resistance. We then ask the question as, as, so, okay, what proportion of the British public are actually exposed to this bioaerosol, resistant bioaerosol? This is the work of Jennifer Shelton, a PhD student in my lab, who leveraged the extraordinary power of citizens to survey those in their environments using these little sticky samplers at four sampling points. We use the solstices and equinoxes across 2018 and 2019. Those isolates then arrived in our lab, we cultured them, we genotyped them for resistance to a common fungicide, tebuconazole, and we then sequenced a lot of them. Our basic numbers were that about 5%, one in 20 spores were resistant to a common agricultural fungicide, an azole fungicide called tebuconazole. And we see those resistance alleles there, TR34 and TR46. We then showed that num these resistant, tebicol resistant isolates were also resistant to the clinical uh, um, azoles that the, the doctors used. So our calculations of this exposure were that the UK app individuals are exposed on average a cumulative 22 days per year. So we're all exposed a little bit to azole resistant aspergillus in the air every single day. This is in the UK. It may be different in Europe and it may be different in the, uh, in the Americas. This needs to be tested. Another interesting observation, and this is the tireless energy of Jen, was she then didn't stop at air, she started looking into soils. And this documents the 
red isolates, the resistant isolates that she found from the many thousands of fumigatus isolates that she screened from the soils. And what she showed very compellingly was that if the isolate came from, the, the, the isolates were more easily isolated from compost and they had a reasonably high resistance there, 14% in that compost compared to 5% in there. So we're starting to believe that the compost here is some form of hotspot for azole resistant Aspergillus fumigatus. So let's just start, what I'm describing here starts to feel a little bit like a system, doesn't it? And this is what we're increasingly we're exploring and challenging using epidemiology and ecology and evolutionary methods. What we believe is occurring is that environmental fungicides are selecting for resistance. And that may be in farmers' fields, but it may be in other environmental hotspots. Compost is a very obvious one from our soil surveys. And that those spores soft on the breeze are then exposed, exposing, uh, being exposed to humans. If you have a risk factor, then you may acquire a drug resistant infection. Now, this is a changing epidemiology. Nothing stays the same and nothing stays the same these days for sure. Uh, in agriculture, we're changing the agrochemicals we use. Patients are changing in their at-risk um, uh, phenotypes. See, we never had before had COVID-19. Now there are many, many millions of patients with damaged lungs as a consequence of that viral infection that are at risk from aspergillus and need treating with azoles. Climates change, they'll impact thermophiles such as aspergillus fumigators. And along with climate change, biota will change. And there's always some form of ecological warfare between microbes that may impact this uh, dynamic. And there's also pleiotropic effects. When you change a locus at one point in the genome, other changes occur as well. So virulence may change as well. There's a lot going on in this system that which we need to understand. One aspect of change is the new antifungals and in and fungicides that are being used. Now, are we spinning the roulette wheel of dual use antifungals? So this is where we are now, 2023. And after her, a Herculean effort, many de decades of detailed research, many millions of dollars of funding, we've discovered new clinical antifungals, alorifim and phosmanagepix. So alorifim uh, inhibits DHODH, Phosmagepix GWT1. However, because of the limited targets that are available, agriculture has also iterated on and discovered these same two targets. And there are now fungicides developed, which also hit those inhibitors. Iflufenoquin and aminopyrifran are two that we know of. Now that's fine, but if these are widely used in the environment, then aren't we going to be imposing the same natural selection in the environment which will evolve resistance, which will then rapidly disable alorifim and phosmanagepix, and again, spin the roulette wheel. So this is something that policy really, really needs to take into account. It's important. So I'm afraid it's a rather moldy future. Molds such as aspergillus easily evolve in response to antifungal control. We really lack the understanding of the ecological processes that lead to the, the adaptation um, and selection for resistance. There are many extrinsic factors which will influence this dynamic environmental change, widening at-risk groups, and definitely new farming and recycling practices will play a role. And there is the potential at this stage that new clinical antifungals may be undermined by agricultural analogs. Dual use of antifungal chemicals does seem to be currently set to continue. So that's uh, all from me, folks. I uh, would just like to acknowledge the key researchers in the research, but there are so, so many more that I'm just the mouthpiece for. And I will now stop sharing and return to Nancy. Thank you very much for having listened. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. I was wondering how long it would take to hear a fungal pun. So thank you for relaying information about our moldy future. <laughs> okay, so looking forward again to our Q&A in the end, our last speaker we will introduce, who is Dr. Bridget Barker. 
Dr. Barker is an associate professor in the Department of Biological Science at the Northern Arizona University. Dr. Barker is a recognized expert in valley fever and its causative agent, coxidioides. Dr. Barker's research focuses on the ecological niche of coxidioides and the ability to detect the fungus in soil. And her leadership in the valley fever community has helped drive our environmental understanding of this serious public health threat. So please welcome Dr. Barker. Thank you so much, Nancy, for that kind introduction. Let's see if I can share my screen and do presenter mode. It's looking okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about uh, coccidioid mycosis. So that's the disease caused by the fungus, coccidioides. Uh, but first I wanna give a land acknowledgement. So as an ecologist, I spend a lot of time on public, tribal, state, and various other ownership of land. And so I want to make sure and acknowledge uh, those that uh, help support the work. Uh, I'll give a brief background of the organism and talk a little bit about the environmental sampling that we've done. Um, and a brief uh, acknowledgement of the expansion into Northern Arizona. Um, in my lab, we talk a lot about uh, many different fungi. My focus is uh, Coccidioides imitus and Coccidioides postodosii, uh, but we also work on other anigonalian fungi in collaboration with many uh, different people. Uh, so Histoplasma, Paracoxy, Blasto, Amansia, Emergomyces, et cetera. Uh, mostly from the genomic angle, but also with an interest in the environment. So what is this order, Enigonales, and why is it so fascinating and important? Um, it's, a, it's a group that contains many primary fungal pathogens. So these are pathogens that can cause disease in otherwise healthy patients. There are two, well, there are multiple families in this order, but there are two families where we have the majority of these pathogens the Ayelomycetaceae and the Onogenaceae. So Coccidioides here at the bottom of this tree uh, is in the Onogenaceae uh, and the remaining uh, pathogens are in a different family, the Ayelomycetaceae. So they may be under different selection pressures, but we uh, use comparative genomics to try to understand the relationship between environmental factors that may influence the growth, growth of these organisms. Uh, additionally, this order is sister to the Eurotiales. So we just heard from Dr. Fisher uh, talking about the Aspergillus um, fumigatus problem. And so this is also an interesting uh, aspect of the evolution of these organisms and the evolution of pathogenicity. And so the class Eurotiomycetes contains a broad number of these organisms. Uh, if you wanna dive into this a little bit more, uh, this is from a uh, recent uh, uh, review paper that we have on these fantastic beasts. So why are they so fantastic? Well, most of these organisms are dimorphic. So in the Anigonales, we have a large number of dimorphic fungi. So in the environment, they grow as mycelia uh, with canadiation patterns that are differentiated between these groups, but in the host, they form uh, yeast-like structures. And in the case of coccidioides, a very specialized structure called the spherial which is basically an encapsulation of yeasts that are very small, so one micron, and these can uh, migrate throughout the body. They have variable asexual structures and the yeast phase is highly differentiated. So where do we find these fantastic yeasts? Uh, so interestingly, uh, I think, and in comparison to what was presented on Aspergillus, we find a large uh, diverse uh, distribution of these organisms in North and South America. So uh, the diversity is particularly high in areas like Brazil, uh, but also in North America. So we have many of these organisms that are throughout the environment in North and South America. Uh, histoplasma is global and we do find histoplasma in the other regions, uh, but coxy, blasto, and paracoxy in particular seem to be um, more common in North and South America. So I mentioned two species, Coccidioides imitus and Coccidioides posidosii. So uh, again, following up on work from Dr. Fisher, uh, who designated Coccidioides posidosii as a new species, uh, which is well supported uh, by phylogenetic evidence. 
uh, we found that there's also phenotypic differences and it's related to temperature, interestingly. So at 37 degrees, imidus actually grows more poorly. So it's not completely inhibited, uh, but growth is definitely uh, much slower. And this is consistent across hundreds of isolates that we've looked at. The disease is environmentally acquired. As we've been discussing, many of these uh, organisms aren't transmitted from host to host, but rather acquired from the environment. Uh, there's very little evidence for transmission from an infected host, except in very rare cases. So like an organ transplant uh, from tissues that were uh, previously infected. Um, and unfortunately, we have really limited data on the environmental niche, right? So this limits our ability to uh, do good modeling, have predictions about when and where the organism is going to be most present. Uh, so this uh, pathogen really does infect almost all healthy mammals. We have rare cases of dolphins off the coast of California becoming infected with this pathogen. It also exhibits strong bi biogeographic patterns. And again, this is follow-up work uh, that was published um, by Matt Fisher. Um, and we surveyed a number of additional isolates to determine uh, if there were differences in uh, Phoenix and Tucson. So a primary question here was, do we have that much genetic differentiation that we indeed can tell the difference between a Phoenix isolate and a Tucson isolate? And indeed we can. But we also observed that there are um, unique genotypes in different areas. So Texas, South America have unique genotypes. And this is very distinct from the imidus genotype that we find in Bakersfield, which is very different from the imidus genotype that we find in San Diego, et cetera. So what have we learned about where we observe high case rates? So the endemic region, um, regions that are colonized by this organism have hot, dry, alkaline soil. And these areas are also occupied by other endemic species. So if we think about the biotic factors that are associated with coccidioides, uh, you know, we have cacti that are, that are really only found in uh, North America and South America, armadillo species, various reptiles, various mammal species that are really only found in North and South America. But in addition, there are many other microbes that are present only in these areas, and those are very poorly characterized. Desert soils are really characterized by biocrust, so the surface layer of microbes and algae uh, and mosses that help to stabilize the soil um, are being impacted by anthropogenic factors, and that surface soil, surface soil as, it's, as it's degraded will impact uh, other layers of the soil. In addition, there are abiotic factors such as highly alkaline uh, soils, saline soils, seasonally heavy rainfall, extremely high temperatures, high UV, dust storms, wind erosion, et cetera. So all of these factors uh, really put selective pressure on organisms in this desert environment. And in particular, um, coccidioides seems to be well adapted to these um, factors. One thing that we've been really trying to work on, um, so I've actually been working on this for the last 20 years, uh, is to try to understand the ecological niche of this organism. The first step really was to design um, a detection assay. So it's very difficult to grow this organism directly from the soil. Um, and we didn't have good molecular tools. So the first step was to really develop a good molecular tool once we had that molecular tool, then go out into the environment. So our tool is a TACMAN based probe assay. Uh, that is um, a paper that was published in um, uh, medical microbiology. Um, and you can find that paper or you can reach out to me and I'm happy to share that. Once we had the tool, then we went out and did a bunch of sampling of soil. Um, so in this design, we uh, looked at regions of Northern Arizona and regions of Southern Arizona. So Southern Arizona, Phoenix and Tucson are known to be hot spots in the environment. Flagstaff and uh, near the, the Lake Mead area are not known to be uh, really hot spots for this organism. We designed the study so that we selected soil from rodent burrows. You can see some pictures here of various types of rodent burrows that we observe, and then surface soil that was adjacent to the rodent burrow. Uh, in total of 131 uh, samples uh, from these, there were 36 that were positive for coccidioides. And if we look and split those by burrows versus non-burrows, 25% of the samples from burrows were positive versus less than 1% near burrows that were positive. So clearly 
animals or animal burrows or the burrow environment is somehow playing a significant role in the distribution of this organism uh, in the environment. So now that we have that great preliminary data, now we have funding to actually do some long-term monitoring of these positive sites. The so one feature that has been um, observed uh, since the 1940s is that the, the positive sites are hard to find, but once we find them, these sites tend to remain positive for decades. Um, when we have been able to isolate uh, from the environment, most of the isolates that we obtained from a single site are clones. But most of the patient genotypes, uh, or most of the patient isolates have different genotypes. So that's a little bit of a, a, a controversy in our field. So is the diversity in the environment different? Are we um, you know, not really capturing the total diversity? So one of our goals is to actually develop methods to directly um, create whole genomes from the environmental DNA that we're extracting. So we're using a hybrid capture method to uh, pull out coccidioide specific DNA from these environmental samples that we've identified that are positive and then reconstruct the whole genome to really understand what's the actual diversity in the environment. Additionally, since we're able to go back to these sites monthly uh, for three years, we have great opportunity to look at temporal variation, seasonal uh, impacts on the when we see potentially higher fungal burden in the soil versus lower fungal burden in the soil. Is it related to soil temperature, soil moisture, et cetera? So we'll be able to look at all of those uh, variables. And in addition, look at how these genotypes might change over time. And so these questions are to be answered. Uh, hopefully in the next few years, we will have answers to these questions that have been um, sort of confounding us for many years uh, in the coccidioides field. So just to get back to um, the, the topic for uh, today, climate change and fungal pathogens. So again, why do we care about this? It's because these organisms are, are acquired from the environment. We don't have vaccines. There's not a single fungal vaccine. Uh, therapies are limited, as Dr. Fisher pointed out. Thermotolerance is becoming more com common, as uh, Dr. Kosadeval pointed out, right? We know that long-range dispersal could happen, so we could have the spread of these organisms to new areas. Um, so these are opportunistic or um, uh, we could have more of these organisms in the environment in novel in novel regions. So just to finish up with what we've observed in Arizona, um, so we know uh, Maricopa, Pima, and Pinal are hyperendemic counties. So in this map of the counties of Arizona, these are the three counties that we are most concerned with. So we know that that is a hotspot for coxie. But what we've observed is we see these upticks uh, occasionally in regions outside of that. So do we actually have the organism in the soil here or is this just travel related cases? So we, um, a, a, a talented PhD student in my lab, Heather Mead, um, actually looked into this question specifically. So she went to all of the counties in uh, Northern Arizona, collected soil, and also looked at the case rate. And indeed, we did see an increase in cases and we did discover that there is coccidioides in the soil in all five counties in Northern Arizona. So has it always been there? Is this a new migration? Um, and again, these are questions that still remain to be answered, but uh, this is tantalizing evidence that we need to, we need to start considering regions that are near endemic areas and not just focus on endemic areas in terms of both environmental sampling as well as clinical outreach and in, in uh, increase in testing and uh, thinking fungus uh, when, uh, when a person comes in with a respiratory disease in Arizona. So I wanna thank our funders uh, and all of the people in my lab group that have contributed to this over the years. And I wanna thank you for your attention uh, and I will stop sharing. Great, thank you, Dr. Barker. Okay, well, we have 11, 10 minutes for Q&A, so that's pretty successful. So if we can have all of our speakers come back and we'll, we'll start our Q&A and hopefully we can answer them very efficiently so we can get as many questions answered. So there's a few that we have, plus some from the um, 
participants. So the first one, this is for you, Dr. Casadevall, but any speaker, please chime in as well. So I have to imagine that uh, when you and colleagues were coming up formulating this theory of climate change and global warming having an effect, a role in the emergence of sea oris, one of the big data points that was missing was um, its isolation from the natural environment. But that happened recently afterwards, like you pointed out from the Andaman Islands. We did have a question about that. What I'm wondering is what other data would you like to see? What's sort of the, the next kind of data or experiments or you know thing that you'd like to see that would maybe further support this theory or maybe even shed light on an alternative hypothesis? Uh, thank you, Nancy. Uh, I'm a scientist, and just because we propose this hypothesis, you know, it's our job to tear it down. Uh, that, that is how we make progress in science. We cannot, we cannot prove anything. We can only prove things wrong. So one of the things that you could have proved the current theory wrong would have been if the isolates uh, from the, uh, the uh, we would have found it in other mammals, right? If you found it in other mammals, then it would have already been temperature adapted. Therefore it didn't quite make that kind of sense. But the fact that you found it in the environment and it wasn't as well adapted, well, that's consistent with it. It doesn't prove it. It's just one part that fits within it. What would I like to see? I would like to see more mapping of the natural world. I want to know what's out there. And this is science that doesn't get funding. This is science that is not exciting, but we need to know what's out there because what I worry about is the next one. The next one may very well be an organism that causes disease in insects, in reptiles, but it's adapted to only to 35 degrees, but it's already loaded up. And then if it went to higher temperature, it's gonna give us a brand new disease. And I wanna end by saying that a lot of the wild fungi are already drug resistant. Uh, this has been looked at already. Uh, they're resistant against all or antifungal agents. So we need to be prepared for the possibility that we're going to be getting a new disease for which we have no and no, no therapy. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, moving on. This one's for Dr. Fisher. So Dr. Fisher, you alluded towards the end that we might be um, repeating history um, in terms of these new antifungal compounds like alorfen and others. So in reflecting back on this decade's experience with azole resistance for A. fumigatis, what do you think are some lessons learned? I don't know, maybe in environmental surveillance or others that we can learn and apply to when thinking about the future and these future antifungals. I mean, certainly surveillance is incredibly important. I mean, if you don't look, you don't find, and then you can't start making connections. I mean, clearly we need crop protection. I mean, the, the bottom line is we have to feed the world. So if we are gonna have new fungicides because the old ones don't work anymore because they've been used and the fungi have evolved away from them, we need to make sure that we don't spin this roulette wheel again. So for a start, appropriate risk assessment needs to be uh, done. The very obvious question is, can you raise a dual cross resistance um, to alorophone with iflufenoquin? And so those tests uh, need to be done and they need to be reported in the risk assessments as well. So the problem here is that when you're reg legislating for an agricultural fungicide, or a clinical antifungal, then the regulatory agencies don't compare the data sets. So there's a complete siloed risk assessment. So they're actually, these risk assessments have to contact and data has to be shared. And then we can spot the problem. And then we can actually, as technologists, as scientists come up with solutions, because obviously you can use these com com um, compounds in the same, at the same time. You just need to make sure that the resistance doesn't cross over and cause a problem in a pathogen. So it's highly solvable, but we need to be intelligent about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, moving on, so Dr. Barker, this one's for you. 
Um, you've touched on um, some of the work that you and others have done with developing um, molecular tools, but you know, in thinking about um, environmental surveillance, what would you like to see happen technology-wise, I don't know, operational-wise, policy-wise, to where we can do environmental surveillance in an easier way, a more systematic way? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a difficult question. So I think one of the things that um, you know you and I have talked about this before is the air uh, air monitoring. And so if we could uh, you know have more accurate uh, air monitoring and doing it on a regular basis, maybe that would be uh, something that would help uh, in terms of you know alerting the public, oh, there's a high burden of of the fungus in the air column. Um, but it seems that the air sampling methods haven't worked uh, as, as easily as we had uh, hoped they would. And so I think, you know, newer technologies that could potentially be more of a direct readout so that we wouldn't have to collect the filters, do the DNA extractions, do the PCR, et cetera, that if there was some way to actually um, automatically detect the spores in the air column uh, in, a, in a more rapid fashion, I think someone developing that technology would be, uh, would be, you know, groundbreaking and would change the landscape. Great, I'd love to see that. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, uh, maybe to hit some questions from the chat, again, if anybody can chime in, but I think this is more for you, Dr. Fisher. Uh, we have one question. Do you think the aspergillus resistance is less common in the Americas over the UK because people in the UK are more likely to have compost in their backyards versus in the Americas? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question and it's it's something that we're actively thinking about. I mean, I mean, resistant, widespread resistance was dis detected in Europe first. And it's clearly very, very common over here. It was first, uh, it was first noted in the Netherlands. Um, we do a lot of composting. We're very, very keen on recycling. I mean, Europe is an incredibly densely populated, populated and well-used environment. So yes, it, it could be an ecological systems um, uh, that's, that's actually causing this high density uh, contact between chemicals and aspergillus in composting. Um, I mean, I've just got to raise that caveat again. We haven't systematically checked out the air in the Americas. And this is happening all over South America. So there's a continent-wide surveillance using those citizen science methods that uh, uh, that I showed. So I'm, I'm really on the edge of my seat to see what that result comes back with. Um, and uh, there's similarly kind of ambitions for North America. So I think we're going to get eyes on that soon. But I think it's going to probably be a real finding. Yes, I'm excited to see that data as well. Well, uh, I have one question I think a lot of people would like to hear. And if we have more time, we can go back to the, the chats. But, you know, one thing that's on a lot of folks' minds maybe is, you know, uh, we just have to pay attention to the fact that there was an HBO series hit earlier this year, The Last of Us which I think many of us have spent hours of our life watching. And for those who haven't, it's about a fungal infection that uh, causes a global pandemic and brings on the apocalypse. And it's loosely, loosely inspired of fungal pathogen Ophiocordyceps. So to all three of you speakers, has The Last of Us changed your work in any way, even if it's just awareness, but has it changed your work? <laughs> Well, I'll begin. I think we had our 15 minutes of fame. Uh, there was a lot of people, uh, a lot of newspapers wanted to talk about. And the question that I was asked over and over again was, can this really happen? And my the answer that I always gave was unlikely, but not impossible. And I just remind everybody that fungi make LSD. And is it totally out of, out of the work realm of possibility? that some fungus will make some compound turn into fungus, unlikely, but not impossible. Thank you. All right. Um, oh, go so on. From, yeah, from, 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 my, from my point of view, I just think we're, we're 
forever um, amazed by the creativity of, of fungi to to do to you know to do great and wonderful things as well as you know to pose totally implacable um, pathogens and you know the, the the desperate situation that the world's amphibians find themselves in is largely due to uh, previously completely unknown fungi busting out of some endemic focus across the planet. So, um, you know, I, I would I would never feel um, complacent with fungi around. Thank you. Well, I know we're at time, so I'll turn it back to, to, to Myron. Thank you all so much. Next slide, please. All righty, uh, and just a, a quick thank you uh, again to you all for jo joining us. A special thanks to our moderator and the pre presenters who have presented a, a wealth of knowledge for, for us to consume. Uh, if you have any questions about today's uh, presentation, please send an email to ehnexus at cdc.gov. Uh, thank you all so much, and we hope you have the, a great rest of your day.